Fortune really does favour the brave in financial markets. The most successful traders are usually those who make big, bold calls and then put their money where their mouths are. My guest today certainly falls into that category. In early June last year, he sent me an email highlighting a buying opportunity in the Italian stock market. It was a gutsy call. At that time, the European crisis was raging and Italy was at the very centre of it. The Italian market was languishing down around 13,000. Less than two months later, it had begun to rally hard once again, hitting almost 18,000 in early February this year. That's a gain of 38% in just seven months. And that wasn't a one-off either. Back in 2011, when America's Dow Jones index was around 10,700, today's guest put out an announcement predicting a move to 14,200 by the first half of 2013. Quite a few people laughed at him when he made that very precise forecast. Fast forward to the first half of uh, 2013 and, well, they're not laughing anymore. Today he's going to be telling us about some of the hottest opportunities that he sees here and now. Vince Stanzioni, welcome to the show. Great, good to be here. And good to well, brilliant to have you on. Um, after uh, um, I've been following your stuff for quite a while, and uh, obviously you've made some really, really great calls. So I, I thought we'd start off on on the Dow Jones. Um, it's done exactly what you said it was to 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 a, a very high degree of accuracy, and I think we should understress that because you know that's a, like a thirty something percent move since you made that call. Now, in, in stock terms, you get 30% moves all the time. But for a big, old, slow index, index. a 30% yeah. move is something to write home about. It's not something that happens all the time. So now we're up at new all-time highs. What happens next? OK, the first thing, let's just talk a little bit about the Dow. And the reason why I use the Dow, it's still the index that everybody looks at. You know, if you ask somebody in the US or what market is the US market, they'll say the Dow. Of course, the professionals know it's the S&P 500. Um, so it's also it's an industry in interesting index. The way it's worked out, some people know it's not particularly weighted the same way as the S&P, and if it's only 30 stocks. The other thing we also need to just realise as well, the Dow today isn't the same Dow as it was three years ago, six years ago, or seven years ago, because they changed the components. So for instance, in the Dow 30, there's no General Motors anymore. There's no Citibank anymore. Kraft was recently taken out because it spun off, and uh, United Health has come in. So what they do with the Dow is basically what, really what I call a survivor basis. So if you think about it, the Dow in a certain way, and probably not the correct term, but it's almost rigged to go up. Because if stocks are not particularly doing very well, they fall by the wayside. Because it's all done by committee, isn't yeah, it? A bunch of journos sit down and go, what represents, what represents corporate America US? today? Exactly, right, okay. exactly. So really, when people sort of say, oh, market's going to crash or the Dow's going to crash and what have you, well, maybe short term it could, but long term, you've got to think that index is actually rigged to go higher. Okay, now that's a nice way of looking right. at it. But the key question is, can it keep going higher? Because, you know, we, I mean, this has been a fantastic rally. We're up from, uh, was it sort of okay. uh, 6,000 something or rather back in... More in than 130%, yeah. Massive move. Basically double. But then at the same time, I can also counter that argument and say, well, actually, anyone that's invested in the last five, six years, well, going all the way back, as you see on the chart, hasn't made any money. Yeah. So my argument to that is, well, that means we've still got more to go. Now, mm. I also follow seasonality, and I think you yeah. also look at seasonality as well for those that are not viewing. I'm a big fan of the 80-20 rule, which is the Pareto principle. And if people have been in sales or business, that basically 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clients. In your wardrobe, let's say you've got 10 shirts, chances are two are your favorite and you'll wear those the most, and eight, well, are fashion mistakes, or you'll wear them on a special occasion. Now, in markets, if you go through and look at where the gains come, normally it's the first 90 days of the year yep. and the last 40 days of the year. And they'll say and sell in May and go away. Right. But if you look through, there is some truth in that, in that there are sections of the year where the market is more active, sections where it does much of nothing, and sections where it's a little bit weaker. And we're about to enter into the weaker time of the year, roughly about mid-April, to the start of May. And last year, in fact, we topped out, I think it was the 1st of May. Yep. And then we did much enough in the in over the summer. And then about October time, 
we started getting bullish. And when you earlier said about my call, I actually made that on September the 26th, 2011, Dow's 10,700, and part of the reason why we were about to go into the bullish period as well. So I had a bit of wind behind my back. So pessimism was very high, and we were just about to go into slightly bullish period. So now we are going to go into the slightly negative period. And I say seasonality, it's a guide. It's not a guarantee. So it basically means that just because the last 50 years, September has been a weak month, it doesn't mean that this September is going to be weak. It, you know, you've got to take it in the view yeah. of a time frame. But I think now, going into the summer months, I think we'll have a pause, and if not, some sort of a sell-off. And some people might say, oh, that's it, we've topped out. And the sell-off, it could be 7 10%. Right. But it still would only take us, you know, we're only giving back some of the froth, let's say. So you'll be buying into that sort of pullback. Yeah, or I might even just be holding with longer-term right. stocks. I'm not even going to bother selling out. And then we can look to go again. But I believe we've got a lot more to go. So, okay, just uh, you don't mind being specific yeah. because how, how high maybe for have you got a 2013 target or anything like that? Well, going out a bit further, I'm looking at 25,000 for the Dow. Wow. And people will say, oh, here we go again, right? But I'm talking about probably in the next sort of eight, ten years. So, okay. or, on almost double again. But if you chunk that down and work at seven to eight percent a year and compound it, you then start to see how that that's quite possible. Um, and some people that like, you know, especially the gold bugs, they're all saying, oh, inflation, money's being printed, and we can talk a bit about later. But of course, that also helps stocks as well, because stocks are a good way to hedge yourself against inflation. Okay. And people don't tend to talk about that. So uh, once we've had whatever correction we're, yeah. we're doing. Oh, or even just a pause, maybe okay, the summer, sideways, sideways bit of froth. Then yeah. we'll take off again. Yeah. What, what might we look for this year? 15, probably 15,000 end of year Christmas, we okay. can, can see that happen. Because markets like round numbers. Yeah. If you go back in history, you see when we broke 10,000, we got to 11,000 quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. So I think we could easily see up 15, 15, and that would be what, about 17, 18 odd percent for the year. So okay. somewhere about 15. Okay, that would be a pretty good year. But okay, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one. Yeah. Let's, you've got lots of ideas, yeah. um, individual sectors and things. Let's take a look at uh, the next chart. Now, here we've got, this is the U.S. Uh, home construction, yeah. home builder uh, ETF. Yeah. Um, obviously, we had the m massacre in this yeah. industry connected to the U.S. housing crash. Yeah. And I don't even know if this tells the full story, but because uh, the ETF only goes yeah. back to 2006. Yeah. We came down to $50, uh, well, I mean, virtually yeah. to wipe out here. And then just, just last year, last summer's lows, $8. Yeah. Since then, it's gone up gone uh, f f uh, three times. Yeah. So... You bullish here or what? Yes, and it's a good representation, actually, of housing sales. There's so many different charts you can look at, but they all roughly look the same, which was basically eight, that, uh, 2008, 2009. Housing market was flooded with repossessions, all the subprime, all the rest of it. Builders were literally having to have rights issues, uh, both in the UK as well as the US, to stay alive. Land, you couldn't give it away. The whole construction had stopped. Casinos in Las Vegas were half built. Um, so it's, it's all looking a lot prettier now. It's looking a lot pretty now, but still obviously a long way before we get back to the heyday, and I don't, I'm not sure if we'll ever get back to that. But construction, it's funny, there's a company called um, KB Homes, which is an American builder, just came out yesterday mm. and said it had the best sales since 2006 for housing. Because what you had was a period where no new houses were started. Um, so we've got a bit of a catch-up almost. So in this ETF, you know, for those watching obviously an ETF is a basket basically so you can buy it or, or sell it and in there I think there's about 30 40 different companies so you've got home builders and also a lot of companies related to home improvements Home Depot people like that um, but yeah I'm I'm constructive on that Te technically that's beautiful yeah. I mean you know any trend follower would, yeah. would love to that because it's strong yeah. but also you know little pullbacks along the way yeah. do you look at the valuations here much I, I have to tell you I don't oh, I don't know about this sector but uh, they're still pretty bombed out okay and um, uh, quite a few of the home builders are still not making money they're losing money so they get valued on how much property they've got or how much land they've got banked um, so really now I'm a bit like you I'm always on looking at the trend um, the other thing what we've got now is mortgage rates relatively low yeah. in the US it's starting to get easier to get a mortgage mm. um, because you know a couple of years ago if you had good credit it didn't matter if you had bad credit you can you know people can get mortgages and also there's no confidence people didn't want to buy a house because well, if I buy a house today and it's going to go down what's the point I might as well rent and a lot of people in America are still in rented 
But now we're slowly starting to see that confidence come back, saying, well, you know what, I can maybe buy my own home at these valuations, mm. and we're starting to see you know, a comeback. Okay. Let's uh, let's take a look at the the next chart, and this is uh, this is a uh, once again it's an ETF. Yeah. This is tracking the U.S. Uh, financial sector, yeah. which includes a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, Insurance, not only banks, but banks, but very related to the property market. Yeah. yeah. If we look at the U.K. banks or the U.S. banks, you know, they were heavily involved and still are with property companies and insurance, uh, and of course we see exactly the same sort of fall. And again, we see banks are in better shape. Uh, than they have been for a long, long time. Again, still talking a long way from the heydays of 2007, mm. um, but certainly in a better shape now and coming back and becoming more profitable. Now we're starting to hear about banks starting to pay dividends again, which is good news. Um, a lot of people say, oh yeah, they're all bailed out by the government. Well, the actual US government made a profit on top, probably more by mistake than actual by design. But you know, uh, banks like Citibank have paid all their money back. A lot of the regional banks have paid back. Um, AIG now, uh, the insurance company, is no longer um, government owned. All the stock has been placed out. And in fact, it's the number one favorite with hedge funds. Um, so, you know, that overhang has basically been cleared up. And as you know, with stocks, sometimes they can't go higher if you know there's a seller. So mm -hmm. if the US government is still a big holder of AIG, for, for example, then you know at some stage they're going to get out. But now they've got out, it's you know, it can move higher. And if you look again, if you go across the line there, we're ready to break out. Um, I mean, the technically, once yeah. again, this is, this is beautiful. Nice, yeah. steady uptrend. I mean, yeah. that's the sort of thing you want to be in. Yeah. Um, my only problem here, or, uh, and, and, and to an extent with the home builders as yeah. well, you say how much of this is just because of all the money printing that you mentioned yeah. earlier. I mean, specifically, well, maybe that's not a problem, but what about when it stops? Or what about when they start hinting that they're going to stop? Okay. Because I think all of these stocks are at risk of a bath if that happens. Okay, so if they stop, what's going to happen? Are interest rates going to go to 10, 15%? You know, right now, a US mortgage rate, 30 years, mm. last time I checked, was 3.6%. Relatively manageable. You know, I remember yeah. when I first had my mortgage in the UK, I was paying 15%, 14, 15. That was like 1991. And we're not going back to those days. So if interest rates started to creep up a little bit, to two, three percent, or what have you, would that stop the whole financial market? Would it stop the whole housing market? I don't think so. Okay. Um, and yeah, they're talking about slowing down the QE and what have you. Um, go ahead. I think I think I think do it. Maybe initially there'll be a few people that might be a bit upset, and there could be initial sell-off. But then it could also be seen as positive, mm. because if now the Fed doesn't have to help the economy anymore, well, it means the economy can look okay. after itself, but I still think we're a while off that, and I think it'll be, it'll be gradual. Well, I agree with you, I think we're a while yeah. off that, but yeah. I'm not so confident yeah. when they do take it away, yeah. uh, going by what we've seen in each of the last three years, yeah. that it's going to be so, so good. Okay, well, that, 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 that's a nice one. Let's move on to uh, the next one, which is, this is very interesting, this is, this is uh, the same sort of, uh, an ETF, yeah. tracking the biotechnology sector, the racy side of the yeah. pharma industry, the drug discoverers, exactly. the little companies that are trying to find the cure for cancer, or yeah. or what have you. Um, once again, I mean, it's, but you've, it's been a, a much stronger and more consistent recovery yeah. since 2009. We've seen those other ones got off to a great start, then yeah. pretty much gave up all their gains, then went up again. This thing is going up. Okay, you've had some pretty big spills along the way, yeah. but there's no yeah. doubt about the trend. I suppose my first question uh, on this would, having gone up so much, is there any value left in there? Um, you know, I mean, it's not bombed out anymore, I don't yes. think. I mean... But you're right. First of all, biotech is still a relatively risky business. The good idea of using an ETF, you spread that risk. Okay, so if mm. you just buy one biotech stock and then the FDA comes out or whatever and it's had a drug which has been uh, failed, a trial or whatever, you've seen the charts fall bang down 30, yeah. 40 percent in one day. So by using the exchange traded fund, you spread your risk. So that helps a little bit. But no, I still believe there's some huge advances in biotech, um, in people wanting to live longer, in healthcare. And it's a sustainable trend. I believe it's sustainable, even with those big sort of pullbacks. I mean, I, I'm like you overall, and yeah. I like buying the ETFs. Yeah. So I like buying sectors and fee and big themes yeah. like that. But uh, I've got at least one mate who's a broker, and he insists that biotech is almost an industry on its own because 
it's it's not less of a beta play. You really need to understand the science and things. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the guys who follow this industry, a lot of the analysts in the bank, are actually medical former doctors or medical Indeed. professionals. Yeah. I mean, it requires so in in a way. But then again, this chart is saying to us, well, you can latch onto the broader trend in the market. Exactly, because the whole point of technical analysis is you don't need to know the fundamentals or the story. Now, if the fundamental and the story basically mm. backs it up, people are living longer. You know, interesting stat, of course, is that. As the population ages, it's spending more on medicine. You know, they say in the last, I know it's a bit morbid, but mm. the last five or ten years of your life, you will spend more on pharmaceuticals, medical, drugs, than you will in the rest of your life. So as we've got an aging population, which we have, um, and people s will, will, sp you know, will spend more and more money. Let's just talk tactics here for yeah. a second as far as, okay, you like this story, yeah. we're... I mean, I don't know if that's an all-time high. I suspect maybe back in 2000 it was perhaps I think, I think we're not far off it. But yeah. How, w what would be for uh, someone who's not necessarily a trader, but yeah. a, a tactical investor who wants to buy into this, yeah. bearing in mind what you've already said yeah. about the Dow or the, the US yeah. market pulling back a bit, yeah. when would you get long? What would you, what, what Mate, would be you might want to wait now until, say, September, October, okay. use the seasonal trend. And if you're lucky enough to get some sort of a pullback like that, then buy them or just buy a few now and then averaging a little bit. As long as that trend stays pretty much intact, which I believe it will, um, it's, it's not a bad one to hold. You know, we, like you say, we're not particularly talking about the next few months. We're talking more about a few years. But I believe there's going to be a continual amount of great discoveries, good news coming out um, mm. in the biotech and the sciences business. Also, what's happening, a lot of mergers and acquisitions. The big fish are buying out the small ones. You know, people like Glaxo Welcome and all the big pharma companies to keep their pipeline going they have to buy the smaller ones out, and so on and so on. So um, it's an active sector. It's not, it's not something that, you know, a lot of people are oh, biotech splash in the pan. Um, and it's had its teething problems, and people can remember probably back in 2000, if um, we had a biotech boom, both in the UK and the US. A bubble. A bubble, yeah. And then it was too soon. It was a case of where people were investing, and it was Dolly the sheep and all these type of things. Um, and obviously got clean creamed off and then basically but now we are actually starting to see real advances and actual money you know real commercializations of drugs being sold okay. um, and the valuations I've looked at some of the bigger ones they're not outrageous they're not actually you know even though after that sort of move so you've got a technical story but you've yeah, also got, got a, a fundamental, a fundamental you know the population not, because for instance demographics very very important I know mm. it's not you know oh today the market isn't going to move on demographics, but you have to look at basically the marketplace of people. And if you've got an aging population, um, you've got to look at what do those people want, what are they going to need. Um, and certainly, you know, drugs and the pharmaceuticals is going to be more and more of the thing to keep them going. Important. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to uh, the next chart. Now, I think this is uh, is this a Citigroup? I think. Uh yeah, I think this is city. It looks like it, yeah, which yeah. basically, um, again, what I talked about earlier, was bailed out by the U.S. government. So is, this it is, the, is this the biggest bank by capitalization? It's biggest part of one of them. And it's, it's, it's got, it's got an international leaders. side as well. Um, so, again, yeah, what had happened, literally, I think it was down to a dollar at one stage or, or the other. Well, this is, this is like here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And this, and, this pl and this played havoc with the, with the volume figures yes. on the NYSE yeah, because... Yeah. In order to trade this at the same value yeah. of stock, they were ha it was sending volume through the roof. And that's one of the reasons why people say the volumes on the, on the uh, New York Stock Exchange have been falling for the last few years. Yeah. Well, in, well, they've only been falling because the s big stocks like this yeah. are worth so yeah. much more. Things like Bank of America and things as well. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and again, been a shocking story. Um, you know, got into all the wrong markets and all the rest of it. Uh, but o over the last few years, yeah. uh, after this initial run up yeah. in, say, 2009, yeah. It's it's been pretty uh, dicey stuff. I mean, you've basically been shopping sideways in a decreasing range, but but now you have got once again this much better. And the story is the U.S. government have sold all their stock. Right. And it's now again one of the hedge funds biggest holdings. So you see where the stock has gone. Uh, there's some very very smart investors um, who actually bought back the years behind and have held it all. But with that out of the way. And now they're talking about the dividend being increased as well, which helps they to pay bring in. Yeah, very yeah, small okay. dividend, but now it's looking to be increased. Um, so, and again, 
very strong in Latin America. They've sold a few divisions. They had an airplane leasing business, which they've gone out. So they're getting back to very core sort of mm. businesses. So again, got the fundamentals backing up. But the best news for me there is that the US government doesn't own any more stock. So it's so now- So you overhang. Yeah, that yeah. Over, exactly. And I think that's what you see in the chart. You see, oh, because everybody knew at some stage the US is gonna try and get out. And they got out in, in tranches, and the last tranche was just before Christmas. So once again, would this be a, a buy on the dip sort of thing? Yeah, you, or even you, buy it now. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to, you know, to pick that sort of stock up. Um, and you know, again, also gives you a bit of play into the property market as well, because you see, it looks very similar, especially lately, to the property market as well. The credit card market, obviously, we've got activity in credit cards. The delinquency rates on bad debt is continues to fall. Um, which is good news for them. So, you know, they're writing off less than they ever did before. Let's just talk quickly about the way in which people should, could play these because yeah. obviously all your ideas are, are to do with Wall Street. Yeah. We've got a largely UK yeah. uh, readership here. So, I mean, two options. One is open a US brokerage account. Which is not as difficult as it used to be because oh, no, most easy, of them easy. have got offices in the UK now. Yeah. Uh, there's certain firms which allow multi trading, so you can trade. Uh, UK, European, US stocks all from one account. There's financial spread betting which have yeah, offered let's US. Let's, let's yeah. talk about that because a lot of readers yeah. who watch this will have a spread betting account. Yeah. Would you be comfortable taking a position here and, and, and running it just for on a sort of slightly yeah. longer term basis? Yeah, because a lot of people think, oh, spread betting has got to be for day traders and what have yeah. you. You know, I know people that have had spread bets on gold and things like for three, four years where they've had longer term contracts and they've rolled those contracts over. Um, so you've got to do it in smaller size. You're not going to. You've got to do it in fair, in, in limited size. Yeah, but if some of the some of the brokers will t will you know if you call them and say this is what I want to do, they will, they'll you know they can do they can help you that because they can obviously hedge the stock out in the market or yeah. what have you. Um, and the other advantage for some people that might be worried about dealing in dollars, if you spread bet, you can still spread bet in sterling. So for Citigroup, for instance, let's say it's trading at forty dollars you can trade one pound a point, or two pounds a point, or whatever. Let's just quickly talk yep. currency risk, because we, we've got yep. a bunch of US stocks here. Yep. Uh, what's your view on the pound against the dollar? I like the dollar. So right. mo most of my wealth is right now is in the dollar, where well, it has been for the last few years. So the upshot has been that it becomes cheaper for me in the UK mm. and Europe. Um, but you know, many people a few years ago said, oh, the dollar's toast, and all the rest of it. Well, my answer to that is, what's your reserve currency then? What currency yep. are you going to trade gold in? What are you going to trade oil in? You know, you go around, I've traveled around the world and what have you, and if you've got dollars in your pocket, yeah. you will nearly always be able to change those. You go out with euros or sterling to some places that are offbeat, they, they won't know what they are. So the dollar is still the reserve currency um, until something else comes along. Okay, let's look at your next one. I'm not quite, um, the, the, um, the names have got, gotten knocked off. I know the last one is AIG, so this means that this one is general. I think this would mean this was General Electric. General Electric. Like. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yep. Again, GE, um, interesting, although the Dow has come back to a new all time high, yeah. GE, which has been in the Dow all these years, hasn't. Right. In fact, the GE would have to get back up to $42, $43 uh, dollars to get there. For those that don't know, General Electric, big diversified uh, company, operates in countries all over the world things like jet engines, finance, which is where it got into trouble, GE Finance, um, washing machines, appliances, um, scanners for healthcare, um, huge, in, into lots of diversified areas. And I think GE gives you an idea of both the US and the world economy. So if GE is in trouble, it's not a great sign for everything else, because it's got its fingers in so many different pi pies. Uh, and at some stage, I wouldn't mind to see if G actually was to do um, a bit of a breakup and maybe do what's called a spin-off, which is where a company like GE will say, right, we're going to take the healthcare side and float that off as a separate company. Uh, and unlock the value. And unlock the value. Yeah. And as a shareholder, you would then get some. And that's been quite popular lately in the US. There's been quite a few companies doing that. But it's looking much better um, for GE. Been quite, I mean, um, a lot of the way it's been a bit more of a choppy uptrend, but I suppose you'd, you'd treat these sort of episodes as a, you know, those yeah, are, those are kind of your buying opportunities, yeah, I guess. Yeah, and you're always going to get news stories related, like, say, something's recalled or whatever, or a jet engine or something, mm. you know, catches fire or whatever. You know, you're always going to get that short term. But you see, it's fairly steadily up. And my view here is that if the Dow is going to hit those sort of figures that I'm talking about, you can easily see the stock double. So uh, going back uh, to those 40s. 
sorry, and let's just get the time. Yeah. And the du that, that's double by seven. Let's say seven. Let's say seven to ten years in that sort of insert. So sort of we're framework. we're twenty five or something now. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so fifty dollars. So thirteen, yeah, yeah. yeah, plus dividend, and it's increasing that dividend as well. It's got a, I mean, for you, this has got a modern, <laughs> it's got a modest uh, target in a way. Yeah, I mean, you know, because yeah. the stuff that you've, you know, yeah, we, yeah, not so ev not everything it's sort it's of. A you know. It's a slow burner yeah. for Vince. Okay, right. Yeah, okay, but yeah, yeah, but also, you know, for a lot of people that are maybe, um, you know, putting some money away and what have you, um, they've got the dividend which they can have straight away now. Is that any good? Uh, it's about three and a half, four percent. Obviously, okay yes, for an American it's, it's stock, that's not bad. I and mean. well, compared to cash, you know, it, it, it's pretty good as well. And also, it looks like it's increasing as well, yeah. which is important. Because it's all very well sometimes people look at stocks. You know, I've made a lot of money in the tobacco industry, um, but the dividends. You know, you look at the chart, and okay, the charts have done well, but also the dividends have accumulated. Yeah. Um, and you could either take some extra shares with those dividends to compound up, which is a good idea, or you know, if you need the income, because a lot of people that come to me are starving for income. It's not necessarily that they all want to make 100% a year or what have you. It's like, look, my banks pay me 1%, 1.5%. Bonds, well, they're not paying great amounts either. You know, where can I go next? And, you know, stocks like GE, basically, you've got a bit of the equity play and you've also got a fairly decent dividend. Let's move on to the last one, which I think is AIG. Yes. Um, now, this, I mean... Disaster. We, well, what an ugly chart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was... Th this was around the time of the bailout. I mean, a huge yeah. gap down there. I mean, yeah. you don't often see that on a, on a weekly chart. Yeah. Uh, and it's and it's been looking. I mean, yeah. even after the so-called recovery from two thousand and nine, yeah. this is ugly stuff. Yeah. But once again, just lately, you've entered this lovely, yeah. smooth uptrend. Uh, and this brings it back in nicely. AIG used to be a Dow thirty stock, right? And of course, then it was taken out the Dow because well, we don't want AIG in the Dow anymore, right? Um, so it's no longer a Dow stock. It's an S and P five hundred stock. But you're absolutely right. And again, the same theme here. The government mm. basically is no longer um, a holder of AIG. They were, and they actually made a profit on, uh, on their AIG shares. So, uh, you know, as I say, a lot of people opposed the bailout, but thinking about it, when the government could just print money itself, invest in stocks, sell those stocks back again, um, and it's done okay. But yeah, again, talking not paying a dividend yet I don't believe but they're talking again to bring back a dividend which helps to bring in uh, holders um, on the whole doing pretty well the only thing they had a bit of a glitch was Hurricane Sandy caught them out and there was a bit more insurance and you know with the insurance business you've always got those risks the force majeure or whatever yep. of a big but on the whole doing better writing good business um, and you know you can't look back and say oh, look what happened there, because the AIG today is pretty much a very different business. Just in terms of when we get in, yeah. is this, uh, would, would you buy this now, or would you once again wait for the pullback in the you market? You can wait for a pullback, or, or buy it now, because I'm not buying it for three or four months. I'm sort of talking a little bit longer term than that. And again, you know, you, you see it's not racing ahead here it's just literally sort of creeping up we've got a target have you got a sort of target for where this one not, could go not really it's a hard one to value because of what happened in the past you know chart wise you can't say oh it's going to go back and fill that gap or whatever that's a long that's yeah a, that's way higher. yeah exactly at some point that's going to happen yeah maybe, yeah but, but uh, it could come back so it's more of a again a theme government's out of it the business has turned around chart starting to look a little bit better again a hated stock a lot of people, oh, no, I won't touch AIG again. It's toxic. I mean, people are going to yeah. have bad memories, yeah. even though the things have moved on since then. Yeah, of course. And, you know, your management's changed, but it's starting to move back. Okay, just, just to wrap things up, we mentioned, we touched very briefly on gold. We haven't got the chart. Yeah. Uh, what is your view on gold? I'm not a fan. I've got a few gold coins, and that's about it. I used to love gold. If you read back some of my old articles from, like, 2001, 2002, I liked it. A couple of years ago, probably a bit early, I said, look, all right, gold's still okay, but you know, if, if you remember basic economics, opportunity choice, which basically means like if you've got 10,000, you've got the choice of buying gold or you've got the choice of buying stocks. You can only buy one. Mm. Um, I believe you'll make much more money in shares than you will in gold for the next 10 years. So, okay, has the, the bull market in gold probably finished now? Yeah. I, I, th I think they might creep out, and I know a few people have said, oh, there might be a little bit more, and there could be a little bit more in it. Um, but I think that's, that story is done. And people say, oh, I'm printing money, inflation. Again, I come back to it. Yes, it, so are stocks. Stocks are also moving up. You see, the problem with gold, it doesn't pay a dividend. Right. Um, which I think is important. And, you know, people like Warren Buffett and what have you has always been a little bit anti-gold because he's saying, well, how do I value it? 
you know, with a company, it's making a profit, it's, um, it's got an income stream, or whatever. The only way you can really value gold is, well, what someone else is willing to pay for it. Or the amount of money that's gushing out these central banks. I mean, that's the other uh, way. And again, well, that's also hard to quantify as well. You know, people saying, oh, this QE printing. But if you look at the other thing, the velocity of money, yep. it's not necessarily going back out again. So they, they're printing this money, but it's not necessarily being used, which makes me think that actually we're not as hooked on QE as you might think. That's a, that's a whole different deep discussion and thing to look at. Um, so it might be a case of people think, oh, there's a lot of QE going on, but it isn't actually necessarily going right back into the markets straight away. Okay, well, some really, really provocative yeah. and thought-provoking ideas there. Uh, hopefully, we can get you back in a few months' time to see, see how you've done, hopefully as well as uh, your last two big calls yeah. uh, for us. But, uh, Vince, thanks very much for Great. coming in. Thank you. Pleasure.